Sutra. After this was said, Ananda and all in the Great Assembly immediately received the first common's instruction in the secret seal, the meaning of Buddha and heard these names for the complete meaning of this sutra. Commentary. After this was said, after the Buddha finished explaining the names of this sutra, Ananda and all in the Great Assembly immediately received the first common's instruction in the secret seal. Everyone simultaneously took in the first common's teaching about the secret seal, the meaning of Buddha. Buddha again is a great white canopy. They fathomed its wonderful meaning and they heard these names for the complete meaning of this sutra. These names were the most comprehensive, the most intimate, the most thoroughly meaningful titles. Sutra. They were suddenly enlightened to dhyana, advanced in their cultivation, to the sagely position, and increased their understanding of the wonderful principle. Their minds were focused and serene. Commentary. They were suddenly enlightened to dhyana. Dhyana is a Sanskrit word which means cultivation of thought. Suddenly enlightened means that their awakening was immediate and swift. They advanced in their cultivation to the sagely position. The sagely position refers to the ultimate one, Buddhahood. They increased their understanding of the wonderful principle. This means that their wisdom increased. Each person's wisdom became further developed. Their minds were focused and serene. There was nothing cluttering their minds. They were clear and open. They were about to reach the fundamental substance of the nature of the treasury of the first common. Sutra Ananda cut off and cast aside six sections of subtle afflictions in his cultivation of the mind in the triple realm. Commentary at this point, Ananda is certified to the second fruition of Ahasri. Ananda cut off and cast aside six sections of subtle afflictions in his cultivation of the mind in the triple realm. He has already cut off the few delusions, and now he severs the first six sections of the desire realm's thought delusions. There are 81 thought delusions in all nine divisions with nine sections each. These afflictions are called subtle because it is not at all easy to detect them. It's hard to perceive them within one's self nature. But now Ananda has been able to cut away some of this affliction. The Seven Destinies, Volume 7, Chapter 4. Sutra, he arose from his seat, bowed at the Buddha's feet, placed his palms together respectfully, and said to the Buddha, The great, awesome, and virtuous, virtuous world honored one, whose compassionate sound knows no limit, has well instructed living beings as to their extremely subtle submersion in delusion and has caused me on this day to become blissful in body and mind and to obtain enormous benefit. Commentary Then Ananda arose from his seat because he had cut through some of his subtle afflictions upon hearing what the Buddha had to say. He got up at this point, bowed at the Buddha's feet, placed his palms together respectfully and said to the Buddha, the great, awesome, and virtuous world honored one, whose compassionate sound knows, knows no limit, has well instructed living beings. Great awesomeness subdues living beings. Many living beings are stubborn and obstinate. They don't believe anything you tell them. They don't believe in cause and effect. They don't believe in the cycle of rebirth. They don't believe in retributions. So the Buddha, devising good and clever expedients, uses awesome virtue. With his awesomeness, which can be overwhelming, he subdues living beings. Virtue, on the other hand, gathers in living beings. So this phrase represents the two aspects of subduing and gathering in. He gathers in living beings who have faith 
and are receptive. His virtue is like a magnet that attracts iron feelings, which represent the living beings he gathers in. The Buddha's compassionate voice has no limits. It is unhindered, reaching everywhere to rescue all. He has well instructed living beings as to their extremely subtle submersion to in delusion. Originally, living beings didn't even realize they were hindered by subtle delusions. So the Buddha pointed it out to them, and he has caused me, Ananda, on this day to become blissful in body and mind. I am experiencing physical and mental joy. I am unspeakably happy, and he has caused me to obtain enormous benefit. I've never known such a tremendous benefit. Sutra World Honored One, if the wonderful brightness of this truly pure and wonderful mind is basically all-pervading, then everything on the great earth, including the grasses and trees, the wriggling worms and tiny forms of life, are originally true suchness and are themselves the first come one, the Buddha's true body. Commentary World Honored One, if the wonderful brightness of this truly pure and wonderful mind is basically all-pervading. If in fact it pervades the Dharma realm, then it is perfect without any excess of deficiency. Then everything on the great earth, including the grasses and trees, the wriggling worms and tiny forms of life are part of that. Grasses and trees are considered insentient beings. Wriggling worms and tiny forms of life are the smallest of the sentient realm. They don't have much awareness. They can move but not far, and their perception is quite limited. Nonetheless, they are originally true suchness and are themselves the first come one, the Buddha's true body. They are all replete with the true substance of a Buddha, the capacity to become a Buddha. Sutra, since the Buddha's body is true and real, how can there also be hells, hungry ghosts, animals, asuras, human gods, and other paths of rebirth? World or not one, do these paths exist naturally of themselves, or are they created by living beings, forms, names, and habits? Commentary, since the Buddha's body is true and real, how can there also be hells, hungry ghosts, animals, asuras, humans, gods, and other paths of rebirth? How do you explain the existence of these paths? World or not one, do these paths exist naturally of themselves, or are they created by living beings, falseness, and habits? Have the six paths of rebirth always been in existence, or do living beings create them? I don't understand the principle here. Sutra, World Honored One, the Vishuni Precious Lotus Fragrance, for example, received the Bodhisattva precepts and then indulged in lustful desire, saying that sexual acts did not involve killing or stealing and that they carried no karmic retribution. But after saying this, her female organs caught fire, and then the raging blaze spread throughout all her joints as, he, as she fell into the relentless hell of life. Commentary Why do I say I don't understand the principle behind the six paths? Ananda continues, World Honored One, the Bishuni Precious Lotus Fragrance, for example, received the Bodhisattva precepts and then indulged in lustful desire, saying that sexual acts did not involve killing or stealing. This Vishuni received the Bodhisattva precepts, but she did not uphold them. He had sex, she had sex on the sly. Having done this, what do you suppose she said? She had a practice speech ready. She lied. She said that sex didn't involve killing or stealing. It's not murder, it's not theft. You are not stealing anyone's things, it's just an enjoyment between men and women, a bliss that they share. What crime is there in that? 
Although the Buddha told us to refrain from it, I don't think that restraint is necessary in this case. It doesn't matter. It's no big sin. What could be wrong with men and women experiencing such a blissful encounter? That was her general line of reasoning. She was really emphatic about it too. She said of such sexual experiences that they carried no karmic retribution. As to sex, she said, have it as much as you want. The more the better, it doesn't matter. Thus, it was that she actually advocated sexual desire. She was a bishuni and yet she was promoting sex. But after saying this, her female organs caught fire and then the raging blaze spread throughout all her joints. It doesn't matter, huh? In her female organs, the fire sprang up. Terrible, wouldn't you say? I believe by then she was being burned so fiercely that she screamed and cried. She was no longer rationalizing that her conduct incurred no offense. Once her female organs were ablaze, the fire spread to all her limbs and joints. That's because during the sexual act, men and women feel a sense of pleasure and contentment throughout their entire body. They take this as pleasure, not realizing that such abandonment is just the next thing to death. What's really happening is that they're going to die a little sooner, just die a little sooner. Plunging into such situations, they totally abandon themselves to the point that they just want to die, both men and women. To die a little sooner is just fine, they feel, but actually they are dueling their way into the house. They are borrowing into the house. The Vishunis joys caught fire because sexual desire belongs to the element of fire. At its peak, there is a kind of fire involved, so we speak of the fire of desire. The blaze was raging so that fire extinguishers and even the entire three alarm crew would have been useless. Why is that? It's because the fire came from her own heavy sexual desire. No amount of water could quench it. What happened to her then? There wasn't any other road to take at that point. She fell into the relentless hell alive. In the relentless hell, there are no lapses in time at all. There are no breaks. Also, its space is uninterrupted. In that one person feels it, and many people feel it. It's not roomy there. Whether you are alone or in a crowd. Further, one knows not how many great ends pass by why one continuously experiences bitter suffering there. There are no interruptions in time or in space. The extreme suffering is unintermittent. Birth and death are uninterrupted. When this Bishu got to that hell, what do you suppose she found? There were iron-beaked birds and iron-mouthed worms that burrowed in and out in uh, of her limbs and joints. The place that received special attention was, of course, her female organs. These creatures would drill their way in and then drill their way back out. Each time they did this, their attack would kill her. But then a clever wind would blow. That wind is a special feature of the house and revive her. So in a single day and night, she would experience tens of thousands of births and deaths. She would die and be revived, die and be revived again and again, uncountably many times. In addition, the house are especially equipped for people who are fond of sexual desire. One of the elements is a copper pillar. It is red hot because of fire blazes within it. However, when one who is fond of sexual desire looks at that hot pillar, one does not see it as such. When a man looks at the pillar, he sees a woman. When a woman, a woman looks at the pillar, it is a man. In fact, they see that pillar as their former boyfriend or girlfriend, so they race towards it and unaware it is a copper pillar. They madly embrace it. The red-hot copper pillar 
then fries them to a crisp. As if that weren't enough, out of the corner of their eye, they see a bed. Actually, it's an iron bed, which is also red hot. But what the person sees is a former boyfriend or girlfriend on the bed. They run to the bed and get burned again. Why? Because their sexual karma is so heavy that everywhere they turn, they must undergo this retribution. This is a kind of retribution the Bishuni Bishas Lotus Fragrance had to undergo. She experienced the hell's while still alive. Could she have continued to state that the sexual act did not involve the killing or stealing and that it incurred no retribution? Once she began experiencing the retribution, it was too late. She wasn't sorry soon enough. This happened at the time when the Buddha was in the world. There was a Bishuni who was this lax. It's not just nowadays that Bishunis are sometimes lax. It happened even during the Buddha's time. Sutra, and there were the mighty king Crystal and the big shrew good stars. Crystal exterminated the Gautama clan and good stars lied and said it realized that all dharmas are empty. They both sank into the relentless hell alive. Commentary and there were the mighty king Crystal and the big shrew good stars. Crystal exterminated the Gautama clan. King Crystal and the Buddha were supposedly relatives, though in fact they were not. King Crystal's father, also a king, wanted to marry into the Gautama clan, since the Gautama clan was a more honorable one than the kings. The Gautama people did not like the idea. No one wanted to give a daughter to the king in marriage, but they didn't dare refuse outright because the king was powerful. A refusal might have resulted in big trouble. Finally, they decided among themselves to send one of their servant girls, a particularly beautiful one, and pretend she was the Gautama clan. King Crystal was an offspring of that marriage. Once while that king was still a child, someone built a temple for the Buddha, complete with an elaborate, elaborate Dharma seat. When the seat was finished, but before the Buddha himself had ascended the platform to sit on it and speak Dharma, the child who was to be King Crystal climbed up and sat on it. The Buddha's disciples and the donors who saw him all scolded him, saying, you are the son of a slave. How dare you sit in the Buddha's seat? Hearing them call him that, he was outraged. And he said to his attendant, Wait until I'm the king and then remind me of what was said here today, lest I forget it. People from the Gautama clan say, I'm the son of a slave. Remind me of that. I intend to get even. Later, when he was a king, his attendant did remind him and the king issued an edict that the entire Gautama clan was to be exterminated, including the Buddha himself. When Mahamaud Gavyayana got wind to this, he went to the Buddha and reported, We have to think of a way to save them, he said. But the Buddha didn't say anything, so Maudga Dhyayana lost his spiritual powers, put 500 members of the Gautama clan into this, his precious bowl, and sent them to the heavens. He thought they'd be safe there. When the king had completed the extermination, Maudga Dhyayana told Shakyamuni Buddha, I've got 500 Gautamas in my bowl stashed away in their heavens. So the clan isn't totally gone after all. I bring them down now and let them go. But when he recalled them and took a look in his bowl, he found nothing there but blood. Why was I unable to save them? asked the puzzled Mahudgalayana. He wanted the Buddha to explain the causes and conditions. 
Ah, you don't know, said the Buddha on the cotton ground a long time ago, at a place where the weather was hot. There was a pond with scones of fish in it. The two leaders of the scones were named Bran and Many Tongues. The water in the pond evaporated in the intense heat, and since the people in the area didn't have anything else to eat, they ate the fish. In the end, there was just a mud hole, but even then they noticed a movement in the mud. Digging in, they found the two big fish kings, Bran and Many Tongues. At that time, I, Shakyamuni Buddha, was a child among these people, who were later to become the Gautama clan. Seeing that the two fish were about to be devoured alive, I beat them over the head three times with a club, to knock them out first. That's why in his life as a Buddha, I had to endure a three-day headache as a retribution. Further, the fish Bran was the present King Crystal, and the fish Many Tongues was his attendant, who reminded him of the words spoken by the Gautama clan to the king as a tribe. So it was fated that he would exterminate the Gautama clan. Even though Shakyamuni Buddha, Shakyamuni had become a Buddha, he could not rescue his pupil from the fixed karma they were destined to repay. The Bishu Gustas was forever voicing his Devon knowledge and Devon views. When he spoke Dharma, he did not speak in accord with what the Buddha taught. He made up his own. For instance, the Buddha instructed us to refrain from killing, but this virtual instruction was, It's not necessary. Why should we refrain from killing? Birth and death goes on and on for living beings, and some of them are especially intended for people to eat. If you don't eat them, what use will they be left alive? They don't have any sense. In this way, he encountered the Buddha's admonishment, not to take life. This bhikshu had originally left home under the Buddha, but later he disagreed with the drama the Buddha spoke. Whatever the Buddha said, he found questionable, and he was able to influence a lot of the less intelligent bhikshus to go along with him. They began believing him. Right, they said. What he says makes sense. What's the crime in killing? It was much the same situation as with the Bishuni, Bishas Lotus fragrance. We just take what we need. It's not that we steal. And if we have something, then we don't need to take it. But if you don't take what you need, how can you get by in this life? That's what he said about stealing. He thought of ways to encounter the five most basic precepts established by the Buddha. Gusta lied and said he realized that all dharmas are empty. His best line was, "Everything is empty. Killing is empty, and stealing is empty. Since there isn't anything at all to begin with, there's no substance to karma. You talk about creating karma, then bring out your karma and show it to me. It doesn't exist." They both sank into the relentless hell of life. They didn't even wait until they died to fall into their house. King Crystal, Bishu, Good Stars, and Bishuni, Precious Lotus Fragrance, experienced hell in their physical bodies while still alive. So Ananda asks the Buddha about these causes and conditions. Sutra, are these hells fixed places, or do they arise spontaneously? Is it that each individual undergoes whatever kind of karma he or she creates? I only hope the Buddha will be compassionate and instruct those of us who do not understand this. May he cause all beings who uphold the precepts to positively and respectfully receive this determination upon hearing it and be careful and clear, free from any violations. Commentary are these house fixed places or do they arise spontaneously? Since Bishuni, Bishas Lotus Fragrance, Bishu Gustas, and King Crystal all fell into the house of life, 
Ananda brings them up as an examples, as examples, and then asks if the houses are in the fixed and certain place. Is it that each individual undergoes whatever kind of karma he or she creates? Each of these three people had to undergo retribution in accord with the kind of karma they created. What is the principle involved here? Are the hells prepared in advance of them, or do they make their own? Where do hells come from? How do they relate to the creation of karma and the undergoing of retribution? Are the hells public facilities like prisons, or are they private cells? I only hope the Buddha will be compassionate and instruct those of us who do not understand this. I'm totally uninformed on this matter," says Ananda. "I am as innocent, innocent as a child when it comes to this. May it cause all beings who uphold the precepts to positively and respectfully receive this determination upon hearing it. I hope they will all listen and obey, obey the decisive instructions offered by the Buddha." I hope they will be careful and clear, free from any violations. May they cultivate with the utmost purity, and be very cautious and clean, so that in no way do they transgress the pure precepts. Please, Buddha, explain this for us. Sutra. The Buddha said to Ananda, "What a good question! I want to keep all living beings from entering into different views. You, you want to keep all living beings from entering into different views. You should listen attentively now, and I will explain this matter for you." Commentary: When the Buddha heard Ananda ask how to help living beings of the future guard the precepts carefully. He was extremely happy. The Buddha said to Ananda, "What a good question! This is a most appropriate question. It's exactly the doctrine you should be asking about. You want to keep all living beings from entering into different views. This can keep them from falling into different knowledge and views, and help them to obtain proper knowledge and views instead. You should listen attentively now, and I will explain this matter." For you, Sutra. Actually, Ananda, all living beings are fundamentally true and pure, but because of their false views, they give rise to the falseness of habits, which are divided into an internal aspect and an external aspect. Commentary. Actually, Ananda, all living beings are fundamentally true and pure. But based on the truth, they give rise to falseness. They produce ignorance. From ignorance, they give rise to false views. Because of their false view, they give rise to the falseness of habits. These false habits pertain to their internal physical being and to their external environment. They are divided into an internal aspect and an external aspect. There are false habits that occur outside the physical body, and false habits that occur within it also.